And uh, I'm speaking here at uh, Emerging Earth Tent. Um, I'm hugely grateful to Claudia and to Igor and uh, to MCH for providing this platform for talking about the impact of uh, internet and technology and hackers to the environmental sustainability and, and our Earth. Uh, the um, overarching topic for my talk today is communities. So how can we join up in our efforts to contribute to the solution of our problem without being too um, doomsaying and pessimistic? And the most concrete uh, thing that I want to talk about is a conference that I attended called uh, Computing Within Limits. Oh yeah, also uh, I'm going to be lisping because I got uh, bitten by a wasp yesterday in my tongue. So <laughs> it's... Uh, <laughs> It's, it's, uh, I'm lucky that I can speak at all. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the conference itself was uh, an uh, academic interdisciplinary uh, event that actually has been happening since 2015. And uh, this was the eighth uh, edition, also because they were disrupted by, uh, by the pandemic. And I haven't I've been there in person ever, but uh, I've been following them closely since 2018. Uh, so this year it was a virtual event. And uh, uh, the connection between that conference and the uh, hackers community is that they have been talking about the topics that we have been also covering here at MCH. But also there is a third community that I want to talk about, which is the RIPE community, because I work for the RIPE NCC as a community builder. And the RIPE community also has a big overlap with both the hackers community and the academic researchers. So um, I'm going to come to this like from kind of three um, angles. And uh, since we don't have here slides or anything, so all the links you can find at uh, RIPE Labs, which is labs.ripe.net. Uh, I have published the article there going through some of the papers that have been presented at the conference, but we also have a section about sustainability and the other articles are, for example, about how is the, uh, the flooding uh, that uh, consequence of the both climate change and uh, uh, sea level rise going to impact the data centers. So how can the data center industry prepare for the future of the um, two centigrade uh, higher average global temperatures. So uh, computing within limits, yeah, it's, it's a nice conference. Let me just uh, read about the conference from uh, their own words. So as an interdisciplinary group of researchers, practitioners and scholars seeking to reshape the computing research agenda grounded by an awareness that contemporary computing research is intertwined with ecological limits in general and climate and climate justice related limits in particular. 2022 submissions moved us closer towards computing systems that support diverse human and non-human life forms within thriving biospheres. So that, that sounded wonderful like before it started and then there were great, great, great um, papers presented and also the format was super weird. Uh, they uh, have published all the papers in advance. So um, then the presentations were limited to 10 minutes, which is very short for academics. And, uh, and so, <laughs> so, they, uh, so there were like a three, uh, three papers presented uh, at every session. Uh, so that would be like a half an hour. And then there was one hour discussion session in breakout groups called reverse panel. So the authors would publish some questions, like what did they want audience to comment on? And then the participants would uh, have discussions between themselves and write their feedback in the uh, collaboratively edited documents. Unfortunately, Google Docs, but still. So everything was uh, uh, 
published, uh, uh, public and transparent and open, and uh, the participation was also for free. So it was really nice uh, group exercise in, in uh, like really interdisciplinary. You had people from social sciences, uh, the computer science, the the uh, artificial intelligence, the activists, the artists. So it was really really nice. So some of the papers. Um, that I found interesting, for example, strategies for degrowth computing. So that's a combining this concept, economic concept, alternative economic concept of degrowth with the uh, research into uh, the, the new development of hardware and software and how can we actually do that by um, sticking to the physical limit as by extending the, the uh, life of computers, um, increasing the intensity of use, and um, what, what else did they say? Um, hardware repurposing, software design for the lowered power requirements, and so on. So uh, that actually ties up with uh, your uh, talk and the discussion that we had yesterday. And it also, like all, so many talks uh, there have mentioned something called Javon's Paradox, which is about the uh, how the increase in efficiency actually only leads to the increase of demand. So it doesn't, like the increase in efficiency, which is supposed to then keep the um, expenditure lower, doesn't happen. Because the more things you provide, like they, they often give um, example of highways because it's just more uh, tangible for people to kind of understand what's happening. Like the more highways you build, it's not going to lead to less conge conge con whatever, congestion or the traffic. It's just going to produce more traffic because people will just start using cars more and there'll be like more cars produced and people will want to move further <laughs> away and, and more frequent and so on. So the same is with, uh, with the internet efficiency. Um, So here we are, unpredictable weather patterns. <laughs> Everybody's helping to uh, rescue the papers and clothes from the rain. I'm your reporter now, if you're watching this on stream or even on the recording. <laughs> Thank you for saving all the papers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> we go on. So um, the next work was about calculating the carbon footprint of streaming media. Now this is a super controversial topic because um, the researchers don't agree on how can you calculate the energy expenditure of the streaming media. And so uh, the authors uh, propose the holistic end-to-end -end model that balances the high level and highly detailed approach. And so... <laughs> oh, shit, everything is getting wet. <laughs> So they have published that um, watching one hour of Netflix consumes about one kilowatt of energy, which is equivalent to a passenger vehicle driving about two kilometers. So now you know. When you're binging on Netflix, what does it mean? Um, I'm sure this conclusion will be disputed in the next versions of the of the computing within limits conference but their slides were amazing because uh, so their their paper paper is really worth uh, downloading and and looking into especially if you're interested in this because they have compared uh, the previous research uh, 
like over the, the many years, many people are trying to calculate this and they all disagree with each other. And so um, actually there is an upcoming conference called uh, ACM SIGCOM in Amsterdam at the end of August. And we have organized uh, a workshop there called Building Greener Internet. So one of the papers um, submitted to that is called 13 propositions for something like that, like saving the world with green tech or whatever. But um, that is already pre-published, so it's amazing by posing all kinds of questions related to this topic. So um, yeah, I'm sure it's going to dispute this paper. So the next one, also very dear to my heart, conceptualizing resource aware higher education digital infrastructure which is basically criticizing the fact that all the universities have outsourced their um, infrastructure, like operating their mail servers and the document sharing and everything, to unnamed huge providers of the cloud services, uh, which I don't want to uh, promote here, like let's say Big Five. And uh, the authors ha are suggesting alternative strategies for self-hosting, um, which is kind of return to self-hosting and, and uh, yeah, super weird that, that we went away from that. Um, so I will read it because it's really beautiful. Uh, a first quantification of a potential return to self-hosting emphasizing its effect in energy reduction and avoiding e-waste uh, then uh, policy actions are needed that could enable higher education institutions to retake control over their digital infrastructure by building local services. So this kind of ties to so many different aspects of like uh, avoiding centralization and so on. So this, uh, this mode of operation reduces waste and has the added benefit of increased resiliency to scenarios of resource scarcity and collapse of external infrastructure. The architecture of uh, low impact data centers made upcycled hardware and uh, resource aware software, there is a significant space to reduce digital infrastructure overall resource footprint. So they are proving that it's actually, uh, it's like the opposite of this claim that if you put everything in a huge data center, that is more energy efficient. They're saying it's not, it's actually better to maintain these services locally, uh, not only for the en energy efficiency, but also for the resilience for the climate catastrophes like flooding and fires. And we could see that, like there were outages recently of the huge data centers because of the heat wave and um, also because of just nothing related to climate, but like human mistakes, like the, the Canadian, uh, um, Monopoly Telco went down for several hours and it took down all the services around Canada because they all had their eggs in the same basket. So emergency services were down, um, of course mobile phones and they couldn't even publish like um, warning to their users that they are down because they were down <laughs> and that there was no alternative. So. Uh, yeah, this, this, like what I just said, happened after the conference, so it just really proves the point that um, uh, the resilience is in decentralization. Then there was an uh, interesting, uh, more like a social scientist, uh, artistic paper called uh, The Richness of Designing for Eco-Social Change. So they, they were suggesting to reframe limits to abundance of the resources that are naturally not limited, like human connections, human uh, creativity and care. And so uh, this is really um, like intersectional feminist approach to the concepts of, of limits in computing. So they, they uh, called it like this, a fusion of care infused ecological and social sensibilities to create existential change that would impact lifestyle and political choices and technology use, turning to potentially abundant human resources of imagination, reflection, and solidarity. Uh, their example was of a hologram, 
a feminist economist healthcare art project situated online, uh, illustrating this potential. So uh, they have been suggesting this project at so many places where I went. So there was a conference in Amsterdam called Money Labs. They were suggesting this as alternative uh, economic project. Uh, they uh, actually presented at the HOPE conference when it was online in 2020. And, um, and now here at the, at the Computing Within Limits. So I want to connect this to the like the mental health crisis that also came like to to focus uh, during the the pandemic and their approach is uh super simple so they illustrated with like a, a te tetra whatever it, pyramid uh, something in greek uh, where you have like four points one is you and three is other three of your friends and uh, you form a, a sort of hologram, kind of a hologram, and you, um, each one of your friends has like responsibility for one aspect of your well-being, and they don't have to be experts; they're just your regular, normal people friends. And so, one of them is uh, focused on your physical uh, well-being, the other one on your mental well-being, and a third one on your social, economical well-being. And you meet periodically, and you have a discussion about you. So they go like, "How are you doing?" And then they and then they say, "Oh yeah, uh, last last month or over last six months, I see that this is happening." And then you covered those three aspects and then you have a discussion like what would be good for you and that's it so it can be done in person it can be done uh, online it can be once a week or once a month or once a year depending on what your needs are and that way you don't depend on the uh, health providers which are also depleted and on the uh, classical economy like you really just do this together as a community and then you expand so it's not like once then you do that for other constellations of four people groups so that's what they call hologram okay next one uh, oh yeah i have a question have you um read or seen any of those computing within limits uh, conferences papers before just Claudia. So it's super cool. Go check it out. The link is on this, uh, behind this link. <laughs> uh, it's called Computing Within Limits, uh, together. Like Computing Within Limits. Mm, no, if you just go to labs.rab.net, it's like one of the first articles if you scroll down. It's called Computing Within Limits 2022 Event Wrap. Um, yeah, so all of their papers are available online. I won't talk about uh, more of them uh, anymore. I just wanted to mention these other opportunities for like combining this with other communities. So as I said, um, I'm uh, from the RIPE community and uh, working for the RIPE NCC, and we have uh, many events where you could take part and also working groups where this is relevant. Uh, the RIPE community functions as like a voluntary um, participation of mostly network operators, but also other people who are interested in the uh, global internet governance on mostly very technical level, but we have been seeing over the time that the internet is not for techies and by techies only anymore. So we are including more and more people in um, in our own community and we are of course overlapping with many different communities. So if you have interest in this, you can take part in uh, different ways, like um, in, for example, Internet of Things working group or something that we call cooperation working group where we cover more soft topics and uh, like legal, political, social topics. Because normally we would only talk about BGP routing, DNS, IPv6, security, even security is like top layers. Like with, and, and content is completely out of the question, but actually it's not. So it's kind of creeping in with, with the censorship, with the shutdowns and so on. So these topics of sustainability have also been 
um, covered, but it's really not enough focus on them. So I want to invite you to take part. And uh, you can do that online. We have mailing lists. Um, we are also all over different social media, but we don't have like a specific channel where I can invite you to. There is Telegram, there is Twitter, there is Facebook, um, and uh, Discord and stuff like that. And then we have a meeting in October uh, in Belgrade. Like it's a large conference. There is a call for presentations open. Uh, normally you would have to pay the conference fee to participate, even if you're a speaker, just like here. But we also have a lot of programs that help people uh, who cannot afford to, to pay uh, several hundred euros for like three, four hundred euros for a week of a conference. So we have academic um, cooperation program where the academics get uh, sponsored to come and take part. And we also have a fellowship program where anybody can apply. And then we choose who do we want to, to bring there. So those are the ways that you can take part in the RIPE community. And um, then there is CCC coming up in uh, December, where we will probably meet again. And they had uh, uh, included a lot of these topics either in their regular program, um, uh, when they called the conference resource exhaustion some years ago, or they have a parallel, like a, a separate conference called uh, bits and trees in German, which I will not try to pronounce. Boime. Bits and Boime. And that's happening at the beginning of October in Berlin. Maybe I'll have a talk. I applied. I didn't hear yet uh, if it will be accepted. But um, there will be parts of this community also pre uh, uh, there. So for me, the events are like these. Uh, regular points where we can meet up and, and synchronize what we are working on. And for the rest, there is uh, uh, the mailing list that I'm uh, on together with Claudia and Igor and many other people that we kind of started in 2013 after the OM conference, where I, for the first time, got uh, exposed to these topics. And uh, it's called Uncivilization. And so you can, uh, you can find the link also like Deep, deep, deep down, because uh, uh, following this link, because it's not uh, work related, but I will write it down here anyway. So it's unsave.nl. It's a personal uh, project. The website is maintained by my partner, and um, it just leads to a wiki where there's a lot of links and, and also the mailing list and squirrels. So. <laughs> um, my obsession with squirrels <laughs> also started about that time because um, I was thinking like if this uh, what we're doing to the to the planet leads to the collapse of human society, fair enough, we brought it onto ourselves. But what's not okay is that we bring the squirrels with us. So we really uh, I, I invite you to consider the squirrels when making your uh, po uh, political and technical decisions. <laughs> and um, more concretely, you can take a squirrel candy now. <laughs> <laughs>
but uh, it was not for me. It was not uh, clear what. Uh, uh, for instance, you, you said that it was uh, only uh, uh, people from uh, uh, academics, but uh, uh, it was not really clear what was the you know the goal of something. It was really very everywhere. Um, you you involved it on uh, organizing the limits of computing uh, no, conference also? No, yeah. So I'm not involved in organizing it, uh, but I do know a lot of people who are. <laughs> and um, uh, the the program committee is really mostly academics from a lot of different universities, and uh, it goes around. It's hosted by different universities, and so they try to make it as multidisciplinary as possible. But still, it's very, um, how can I say, <laughs> like, um, it's hard for the people who are not academics to even suggest a paper because you have to write it in that format. Like, uh, so even if they are artists and activists like, um, uh, like this project of Hologram, they have to kind of pair up with somebody who knows how to submit that kind of format of paper, which, which is okay-ish, like you have to work in, in different groups, um, like in, in a group that has multiple kind of skill sets, um, but it does make it uh, difficult to, to join. So this is one of the problems that I see across many communities. They're so focused on their own jargon and that there is so much translation needed between different approaches. Like this is academic uh, approach and so if I would invite them to, to the right meeting, they would be like, well, why should I talk to the network operators? How can I talk to the network operators? And the other way around, if somebody from the network operators would want to submit the work here, it's just so difficult to uh, translate our way of speaking to. So that's why we try to organize a joint meet a workshop at the next academic conference, this SIGCOM. Uh, and then you have to pay a ticket. like for one day workshop it's a lot of money for people who are not really getting anything out of it the same for the right meeting like when we invite speakers from outside of our community um, there is so many obstacles there well the same for mch like some people found it very expensive so there is economic um, aspect of why this crossover is not happening so there is economic blockages the the jargon and um, uh, group, uh, group, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's why it's important to have these crossovers and yeah. to tell people like, but you could take part there, um, and um, the very important factor that is now making things much easier is that uh, we are moving online. So that's both. Like you, you don't have to be there physically. You don't have to travel. You don't have to pay. Um, you can just use Zoom. That, that's for, the for the limits, for MCH, for RIPE, like for everything. Like yeah. if you can't afford to go there physically, yeah. either because you don't have money or you don't have time or you have small kids that you have to take care of, you uh, you can still uh, participate. So this is great. On the other hand, it's it's great to some extent because what is the cost of doing the double conference, doing it in person and actually streaming everything? We don't know what the cost is. We think it's actually not too bad, but, but we don't know. Because partially because it's hard to calculate and partially because we don't want to know because then would, do we have to cut it out? Like do we not meet in person or do we not stream it? And uh, yeah, it's, it's really hard. But uh, but I think I think uh, people would be more comfortable if if uh, you know for sure what the cost is of your action that you could uh, act on 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 your costs. So uh, that's that's this kind of thing is what I expected also from the limits of computing and. Uh, you know, I didn't know anything about it, and I wanted the conference. That was a conference, and I was like puzzled, and uh, and uh, because I really uh, expected something very practical in this way. 
it is practical. Uh, they, they do have a paper published on like, you know, a one hour of streaming. Doesn't matter if it's Netflix or this, uh, costs like driving a car for two kilometers. So some people would, but then is it individual or not? Like, does it take 100 people? Does, it, does the cost decrease if just one person is watching the stream or there's 1,000 people watching the stream? Is it still 1,000 times two kilometers? Or is it divided by 1,000 people? And what is the cost of storing it so that the other 1,000 people can see it five years from now? in the data center, which has to then run 24 seven, so that maybe on an off chance, somebody is going to want to watch this video. And if I have to say like, don't store this because I don't want to kill the squirrels because somebody might want to watch me on a video five years from now, does it matter? Like, does it, like, does it, is it going to switch off the, the data center for five minutes so that my video won't be stored there? It, it, and it's not about personal cost, I think. It's really about the systemic, systemic cost. Yeah. yeah but, uh, but to, to, to act as a, at, a, at a personal level, when you do something, you want to know, uh, you know, what's, the, what's, what's my, uh, uh, you know, ec ecologic footprint here in this action. And it would really help in a lot of things also to, to, uh, uh, to allow people to make decisions. I think that it is part of um, denial that, that, that we enjoy, uh, I personally also enjoy, because and, and somebody else in some other presentation said recently like one of the, oh it was Elvin, one of the answers is like, but we need more measurements. No, we don't. We know it's too much. We don't know how much how, how much too much it is, but it's definitely too much. And, and then the, 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 then the follow-up action would be, but let's not do it. But I don't want to say that because I enjoy it too much. <laughs> yeah, it's not only that. It's also like uh, 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 I was reading a, a paper about uh, like the, the mechanisms, uh, emotional mechanisms towards uh, for emotions towards uh, 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 climate change. Uh, uh, one of the most used uh, mechanisms seems to be this. Uh, well, I don't know if I they say well that you minimize uh, your cost, but. Uh, uh, the thing is, like everything, you know, you, you're leaving, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's too much. So we have to make like a more informed choice, but with less uh, uh, par paralysis, because this causes paralysis. But if you, if you can choose, you know, knowingly more, you know, you don't have to be very, very, speci uh, well, as specific as possible, but uh, you, you know, it, it leaves you some emotional uh, space to make, uh, 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 good uh, uh, decisions. Yeah, okay, I'd like to pass the mic to other people. Um, yes? Um, I really, I would like to have the name of the paper that you mentioned about um, uh, that self-hosting is more efficient because I have been told that, yeah, no, people should go to the cloud and it's also more green. And I've been teaching people that because people explain it to me like, yeah, you share the resources. And I thought that sounds nice. But so I was also wondering maybe if you could elaborate a little bit more now or someone else if they have uh, more information about it. So this specific paper is called Conceptualizing Resource Aware higher education digital infrastructure it's a very long title but uh you can find it back through through this link um and or just computing within limits uh the the, the main author is l uh angeli so you can look it up that way and um of course it is uh, controversial like they, they probably had uh, their own favorite outcome, and then they did the research towards that. Um, on the other hand, it's not only about economic, uh, like energy efficiency, but it's there are other elements in like why the self-hosting is better than outsourcing everything to the cloud. So they probably took those things into account, and and what I like about it is um, the ethical aspects, which is um, avoiding the consolidation towards few actors. 
uh, avoiding the loss of autonomy and um, not delegating your sustainability choices to a third party. So that's, um, that's worth something too, even if um, the ef energy efficiency aspects are questionable. <laughs> But uh, I think they also mention, because they're academics, they mention other papers within their paper. So then you can look, like, look it up, cross-reference, and like, choose your own <laughs> bits to confirm your own decisions. Um, because yeah, that is the, the beauty and, and the tragedy of, of all this like, um, academic research. Like, there is so much knowledge and so much information that, that proves anything and then we still have to choose. Um, anybody else? No? I want to finish on a, on a, on a nice note. Let me see how. Um, oh yeah, no, well, let me talk about uh, some more interesting ones. So there was something about uh, solar protocol exploring energy center design. And then uh, an interesting one uh, called Smart Enough or Too Smart about smart cities. So uh, like that's very IoT, uh, yeah, within the IoT um, topics. And, um, but of course they brought it up with the um, intersectionality to a different aspect, which is saying uh, how all these uh, smart devices um, actually uh, replace uh, or are aiming to replace the emotional labor. So they call that uh, social reproduction. So how does this technological solution actually impact the areas in our life that, that do not have to be governed by the, the Internet of Things or things at all? So, and then they also... Um, mentioned the concept of um, digital circus, circuits of dispossession. So what does it take away from us? Uh, the, uh, leaving the decision making to algorithms and things. So yeah, I'm, I'm having goosebumps. <laughs> it's really like science fiction material, but then uh, in, in reality. Oh yeah, and a very, very cool project or paper about that I thought would fit in the MCH uh, so well. It was called um, OmniFood, exploring the possibilities of a consumer system with ubiquitous access to data about the food we eat. So making choices based on the artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, things and stuff about what you eat. By uh, So they did it in Sweden and they, they had several methods of, of getting to that goal, which is um, intercepting the data between your ha handheld scanner and uh, uh, the computer that like produces your bill, like how much you have to pay for, for the, the things you bought, uh, by also printing the um, uh, ecological footprint information about every item with color coding and like looking it up in the databases which are open and just saying like, well, this avocado traveled from Brazil to Sweden or this meat has been grown locally so it is meat, so that's like really bad, but at least it didn't travel from whatever, like Holland. And so that, that's one way. And then the other way was when you order things online and then it like shows you, you know, what are you going to buy and stuff. And then it also shows you like, this is the ecological uh, footprint, um, yeah, yeah, impact. Yeah. yeah. Uh, where I live, there is an uh, ecological uh, supermarket that's labeling uh, the foods on the real price of the foods you buy, which is very cool. Yeah, so, so there, is, there is work to be done in this area, um, but it is also a lot of, um, I'm sorry, I'll, sp I'll, I'll swear in Dutch, Mirenoken. <laughs> <laughs> 
because it's like you, you you don't really have to know how expensive that meat is it's just too expensive like yeah. on the planet like so uh the same like the, what i'm saying like for the technology like we, we say we need more measurements but actually we know the answer but we just don't like it um yeah, but, uh, you know it's also a kind of uh, i think it's a kind of shaming people <laughs> Also, but it works, you know, I, I don't know, everything that works, it's, uh, I really welcome. You know, if you buy something, they say, well, okay, you buy, feel ashamed, you buy something that's going to destroy everything you like, you know? Yeah, like Tesla. Uh, <laughs> okay, let me let me read some of these slides because uh, it's, it's actually hard, but uh, just to end on a, like, more tech... Um, related. So how to do the degrowth computing? Extend the useful lives of computers, uh, reuse instead of recycling, reuse as energy storage, like information batteries, uh, and make autarkic systems, whatever that means. Um, uh, you, can, you can look up like the details there. Then um, use computers more extensively. So share uh, the unused time, uh, broadly define computers. So like consider all the things that actually have computing power in them, but we don't really think of them as computers, but they actually are. And then use all the other tips for that. Um, and um, create the low power standardized smaller footprint devices. And then the third was degrowth design. So uh, consider these degrowth in the software engineering. Uh, use the flexible computing with uh, the view of intermittent energy. So if you have the uh, like renewable energy sources, they do not give consistent energy. So design for that. Um, in the design stage and then use the open design and uh, the right to repair and uh, dig, uh, use the degrowth for the hardware engineering so not don't wait until you actually have a hardware that can do certain things and then try tweaking software for it but use the engineering of hardware with the degrowth in mind from the beginning but a lot of these are kind of contradictory because that would mean designing new hardware, but the first one was reuse the existing hardware. So uh, they have to be considered in the balance of what what is available um, and what your goal is. So uh, this is where I want to end. And uh, thank you very much for uh, participation. And thanks, thanks a lot for your insights. And uh, uh, we have also a wiki, uh, it's uh, emergent.earth. So you can, uh, I'm going to, to add all the information that what, all, what happened here, but uh, you'll, of course it's a wiki, you can also uh, you know, contribute to the wiki. Thank you.